so glad that you're here this morning. We are grateful for technology, even when it isn't always obedient. <laughs> so we're going to worship together this morning because all that matters in this place is that Jesus is glorified. So would you stand with me? I want to share a scripture with you. Zephaniah 3.17 tells us that God is singing over us. I find that to be such a beautiful sentiment, that God is in heaven singing over his children. And in Isaiah 6, when he looked up into the heavens and he got a vision of the Lord, he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and he said, the whole earth is filled with your glory. And that means that you are filled with the glory of God. So you look around the room today. Everybody that you see in here is filled with the imprint of God. We are filled with his glory. So our response can only be worship. Amen? So that's what we came here to do today. Let's worship the Lord together.
that he goes before you. Thank him this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to know today that he's here in the room where two or three are gathered. The Lord is in the room. And he's here to break chains that are binding you this morning. He's here to be your chain breaker this morning. He's here to take off the bonds of depression, anxiety, addiction, whatever it is you're walking through this morning. So let's praise our chain breaker. Amen.
Come on, if you got pain, let's sing. distracting me right now, but you, Jesus, we magnify you. Come on, people, let's just magnify him right now. Let's put him on the throne of our hearts as we declare he's here to break every chain. Amen. He's here to set us free. He set us free already, but we keep putting those chains back on, right? Let's ask him to just break those chains again. There is power in his name. There is power in the name of Jesus. There's power in his name. There is power in the name of Jesus. To 
break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Come on, there is power in his name. There is power in the name of Jesus. Yeah. There is power in the name of Jesus. Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain. To break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Come on, there's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. An army of worshipers. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. To break every chain. To break every chain. One more time, let's declare it. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Come on, somebody lift him up. Our God is worthy. Amen, 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 amen. Why don't you take a minute and say hi to somebody who's close to you. Tell me about it. Good morning, and welcome to New Evergreen Church. Here are the announcements for this week. Join us for worship at NEC on Wednesday, March 3rd at 7 p.m. Group leaders, bring your members, and let's invite our family and friends for an uplifting night of praise and community. Visit our Connect Center for more information and stay updated by following us on social media at newevergreen.church. Are you ready to publicly embrace your faith? Join us at NEC. We're here to support you every step of the way. For details on Baptism Sunday, happening March 3rd, email info at newevergreen.church or visit our Connect Center in the lobby. Are you new to NEC? Join us at NEC Connect today at noon. Share a meal with us, hear our story, and discover opportunities to connect with what we're doing. Head to the Connect Center in the lobby for more information and to sign up. Interested in learning more about audio, video, lighting, live stream, or presentation technologies? Volunteers are needed for the NEC Tech Team. All training is provided. All you need is an interest and a desire to serve. So ask a tech after service or email us at techboothnec at gmail.com for more information. And that's it for our announcements. Have a great day. All right, how are we doing today? We're doing good? <clears throat> Welcome to New Evergreen Church. My name is Pastor Joe. If we haven't met yet, we are really excited. Today we are wrapping up our... Uh, forgiveness and reconciliation stage. But before we get to the message, we want to welcome all of you. Uh, some of you are here for the very first time, and we know going anywhere for the first time could be intimidating, but you are here, and uh, we're really excited to have you with us. Everybody should have a card on your seat. If you don't, raise your hand. We'll have somebody get one to you. Um, this card's really important to us. It's called our Connect card. Uh, for those of you that aren't into pen and paper, you can scan that QR code. And uh, all things we weren't able to say first service because our projector wasn't working first service. And so the luxury you guys have of being in the second service. <laughs> um, uh, you can scan that. Uh, this is what the card does. One, it allows us to know that it's your first time here with us. We'd love to follow up with you. Uh, two, we are able to let you know uh, about things like yesterday we had a, a really fun cleanup day. And uh, yeah, we, we filled up an entire dumpster of stuff that... Um, was in need of throwing away. And so we're excited about that. <clears throat> Had a whole bunch of people out here helping us out, uh, but could have used some more as always. And so uh, if you sign up on the Connect card, you'll get to know about things like that. Also on the back of the card, there's a place where you can write down a prayer request. Um, we'd love to follow up with you and pray uh, for what you have going on in your lives and, and uh, support you in that way. And so at the end of our time together, you can drop that in the boxes that are outside by the doors um, and uh, that our team will follow up. Um, we're really excited for today. Uh, I just want to, you've heard the announcements, but just to kind of 
uh, pin down one here. Um, NEC Connect is happening right after uh, our service today. And so if you're new to our church and wanted to hear a little bit more about our mission, vision, and values or how you can get involved um, or just hear the story of what God's been doing at NEC, um, we'd love to invite you. You don't have to RSVP. We'll have some food for you. I believe it's Togo's today. And so if anything, you'll get a good sandwich out of all of it. Um, but uh, I would be really uh, honored if you'd stick around with us and, and hear what we have going on here at the church. And so <clears throat> uh, today we're going to be in Romans chapter 12. And so if you have your Bible, go ahead and, and turn to Romans chapter 12. Uh, we're really looking forward to the series today. Um, uh, today is going to be our last week in it. We've called this series Grace in Action. And um, today, you know, we, we've talked about unforgiveness. We talk about a lack of reconciliation um, and today's, it isn't going to be any different. You know, we first started off saying that forgiveness or unforgiveness, right, um, really, really hurts us, right? I just talked to somebody after the first service that said, I have a few people in my life where I know that I have not forgiven them, and it's killing me, right? And, and I said, well, you know that popular phrase, uh, not forgiving somebody is like drinking poison and expecting somebody else to get hurt or to die, she goes, no, I never heard that before. And I go, oh, maybe I should say that next service. And so <clears throat> uh, that's really what it is, right? And so when we think about unforgiveness, here, here's the deal, right? And this is what I hope we can get across today is that uh, God's love empowers us, restrains us, and gives us empathy in order to forgive and to be reconciled, not only to him, because all those things are necessary when it comes to our relationship with God, but especially our relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, right? God is calling us to forgive and to reconcile. And I, and I think as Jesus followers, we need to know that, right? That these are marks of true Christians. These are marks of people who are actively pursuing and obe uh, being obedient to what God wants to do in and through you, right? Um, and so when we talk today, can I just tell you, I have no doubt that peace the peace that we get from forgiving somebody or being reconciled to somebody is not easy. It's hard, right? This is something that is very difficult. I don't know if there are people in the room that are going to be real today, but we all have somebody in our lives where we just have kept away, where we have them in a position where it's like, you know what, I'll keep them over here because I've checked the box of I'm not mad at them, right? So I, I can still find some leeway with God. I haven't said anything to them, but if they were here... I guarantee you the furniture would be moved around a little bit, right? Like today, we're going to talk about what it looks like to combat those things head on with the gifts that God has given us, that you don't have to fight for peace by yourself. In fact, the opportunity that you have to fight for peace is a gift from God. And so we have this opposition that wants us to stay at op uh, in opposition with each other. There is a, an enemy of your heart that says, you know what, I want you to walk around um, with harboring this unforgiveness for somebody. You ever have people, you ever meet people in your life that aren't comfortable unless things are chaotic, right? It's drama. It's hard. It is not fun. And so what does it look like for us to make sure that we aren't walking a, a Christian walk, a faith in Jesus, where we're still displaying those type of traits but what would it look like if we trusted God to transform our heart with his love for us and the power that his love brings in our lives to make us more like him? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Every week, <clears throat> I give you guys a bottom line, and today is no different. Uh, the bottom line is this. I had to say it really slow for the first service because we didn't have uh, the, the screen up there, but we're going to hopefully be on time this week. That's why we started a little bit later. It was my fault. Don't blame anybody else. Um, <clears throat> bottom line this week is this. <clears throat> The Spirit's primary work is to transform who we are and what we do because who Christ is and how he loves us. The Spirit's primary work is to transform who we are and what we do because who Christ is and how he loves us. You see, when God gets a hold of your life, he changes you. And that's not just, he doesn't just make you a good person. He begins to change you from the inside out. I don't know, you can look around the room, but some of you have known each other for a very long time, and you've been a witness to how God has transformed somebody's heart in this room today. Some of you can look back at when you first gave your life to Jesus, and you praise God about how much of a different person you are today than the day that you first gave your life to God. You see, um, when I was new in my faith, I, I always like, it was a mystery to me, 
How do these people become good people, right? You always hear people's hardcore testimonies. They were stabbed 32 times in drug deals in jail, and then all of a sudden they're your pastor. You're like, whoa, what's going on, right? How does God do this transformation? How does this transformation happen with broken, bad people and turn them into good? See, I, I used to think, like, as long as you were just in church and you were doing the right things, like, it was just going to happen. I called it, like, chia pet faith, right? As long as you watered it a little bit, you were going to grow a chia pet, and there was going to be a difference and a change, and you just stood there, and Jesus made you better, right? But can I tell you this morning, it's more than that. You see, there's this thing called obedience when it comes to God working in your life. There's this thing called restraint in not doing the things that you used to do in order to be more like the one that is calling you to be like him. There's things that he's asking us to do, and what I want to say time and time again this morning is that he's not asking you to do these things within your own power. He's not asking you to do things because you should know better. What he's doing is he's saying, these things I am asking you to do are gifts that I died to give you. And the broken parts of your life are the areas that I want to bring freedom to. Can I tell you, um, the, the, this, this young woman that I was talking to in, in the last service can I just tell you, the look on her face was a look of hope. It was a look of, I see a day where I can forgive this person. I see a day where I don't have to walk around with this. And, and I felt like it was my duty to tell her in the moment. I said, I said, you, I don't know if you've ever smiled explaining this situation before, but today you smiled when you talked about the forgiveness of those people that you want to forgive in your life. Like there was a joy that was pouring into her heart in a place where brokenness had ruled for a very, very long time. You see, church, what I hope is we, we understand this morning is that there is hope in the power of God's love for you, that it changes you. This is a relationship where if it is genuine and real, it has to change. You cannot stay the same. You're motivated to be more like him. He begins to break your heart for things that didn't break your heart before. He begins to call you into places where you had no idea or intention of bringing God's light, and he begins to put them on your heart, and he says, I want to do this through you if you will let me. This morning, church, that's what I want to challenge you with. If these things, peace with our brothers and sisters, forgiveness and reconciliation, it's not some far-off utopia, right? It's not Disneyland. It's not this place that's made up, because one day you and I will live a life where Everything is perfect. Everything is in harmony, and God's love will reign for eternity. You see, what he's doing in us and what he's asking us to do, to be obedient to, is to live a life like the eternity that we're going to live once we, live, uh, once we place our faith in him. He's conditioning us and getting us ready for heaven. The word that kept popping up when I was uh, writing this message was training us, training us. And what's beautiful about the room, and I don't care how long you've been following Jesus, the Bible says this, is that you will never arrive there until you face eternity. It means every breath that you take, God is working in you and working out of you for you to be more like him and for you to be more like the, in person, the person he intended you to be. Think about that. That today you are not the person that he is growing you and molding you and shaping you into that we still have work to do. Look at your neighbor and say, yes, you too. You got some work to do. You can tell them. You see, the best place for us to be when it comes to this message today is a, a, as a reflective place. Looking on the inside of my heart saying, God, is there anything that I need to change, fix, or alter where I'm going to see more of your fruit in my life? That's what a gardener does. Right? A vineyard, in a vineyard, you're taking someone... And what they're saying is, I'm going to cut away all of the things and all of the energy and all the growth that does not produce fruit. I'm going to take away so that energy doesn't go there, but it goes into producing the fruit that I want to produce in you. You see, today we would do ourselves a, a favor by placing our hearts in a way to say, God, will you help me point these things out to me? And so um, <clears throat> we're going to be in Romans chapter 12. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and pull it out. Uh, if you don't, they're going to be up on the screen here. Um, Jasmine's going to be real mad at me on the slides here because I'm probably not going to say all the stuff that I have in there. Um, but I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to start. I'll walk us through uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 uh, and 2. Listen to this. 
uh, I appeal to you. This is Paul writing a, a letter to the Romans, the church in, in Rome. And he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Can I just break this first set of verses down here? It says, I appeal to you, therefore. This is what Paul is saying. He says, hey, would you, would you do this for me? Not so that you fall in line and you check the box and that you are a good little Christian, but would you do this for me? Because there is a benefit for you in this. Would you do what I'm asking you to do? Would you apply it to your life? I'm appealing to you. I'm asking you, would you make the decision to apply this to your life? Because not only is it going to be good for you, but it's a gift from God. It says it here, by the mercies of God. What Paul is saying is what I'm about to ask you is a gift from God to you. It's going to help you live a life closer to him where your presence and his presence come together and he begins to give you the purpose for your life. It is a gift from God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. I love that he addresses it to who? He says, my brothers. What he's saying in this situation is I'm asking you, will you apply brothers, the relationship? I'm not just, this isn't just your your pastor talking to you. This isn't just a leader talking to you. He's saying, brother, will you listen to this? Brother, will you take this to heart because it's a gift from God that he wants to give you? You see, automatically, he starts this relationship off. He starts this chapter off with how God's love and the power of God's love begins to transform our relationships. I wonder if you treat better people now than you did when you were first a Christian, when you first gave your life to Jesus. I wonder if you're more patient. And if you're not this morning, maybe that's God saying, hey, this, brothers, I appeal to you. The gift of God, would you begin to put it in practice, not for only your benefit, but for the benefit of your relationships? Bottom line is this, again, the Spirit's primary work is to transform who we are and what we do because of who Christ is and how he loves us. Again, I, don't, I hope I don't sound like a Miss America pageant up here that we're all supposed to just love each other and pray for world peace, right? But it's a place that God is asking us to be obedient in trying to get there. And so today, I have three ways that Jesus' love will transform us. First one is this, is that love produces empathy. Okay, if you went to the high school, I went, you probably don't know what that means. And so here's what it is. The ability to understand and share the feelings of another. To be able to understand where someone's coming from. To have empathy for them. See, Romans 12 says this. It says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. And do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. And what this tells us is that God's love begins to sensitize our hearts for other people. Can I tell you, (laughs) there are people that I see now, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but uh, God will just lay somebody on your heart and your heart begins to break for that person. You see, this is God saying, hey, I'm making you more like me in caring for the people around you. I used to be that kind of person where I didn't really care about anybody else, right? And that's one of the things that I can look at the transformation that God has made in my life from where I am at today, and I get excited about where he's taking me, but if I'm honest with myself, I know that I used to be a selfish person. And sometimes in worship, the enemy tries to remind me, remind me that, hey, you, you're a selfish guy, and I have to remind him, no, not anymore, because I'm obedient to the calling that God has on my life. I'm trying to make the right decisions. I'm asking God to step in for me. And so God sensitizes my heart for other people. The Bible says here, you know, the way that he, we emphasize and have empathy for people is that he says to bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Right? And we're not talking about the monumental things, right? We're not talking about the big fight that you had in high school where everybody knew what was going on. What about the small little things that happen in your car every day that nobody else sees? You ever give the guy that cuts you off the look where you're like, (laughs) you 
know what's crazy? Can I just confession here? I, I, I used to have really bad road rage, and it's something that God is, I mean, not crazy. I never got out the car or anything. Just that one time. But, um, <laughs> uh, and I noticed that as I'm driving, and I, you know, like, I, I, even the, the small remarks I make to someone who cuts me off or I feel has wronged me, right? Can I tell you, I started hearing my son say the same thing. And, uh, and it made me think, man, here I am shaping how they treat people. Here I am shaping how they treat someone they don't even know for one simple mistake. And then I agreed with him. I'm just kidding. <laughs> what does it look like to bless those? Blessing somebody is calling down God's favor for somebody. Cursing somebody is asking for God's judgment on somebody. See, the Bible says that we are to bless those who persecute us. And that's, again, I said it in the beginning, this is not easy. This is not something that comes natural. This is not chia pet faith. This is something that you have to work at every day. You have to begin to build barriers in your life that are going to help you be obedient to the calling that God has on your life. And the, the best tool that we have for this is prayer. Prayer is a tool for transformation. Prayer is tapping into God's love for you that reminds you the same way you've been forgiven, those who you're angry at and have unforgiveness for, they've been forgiven the same way. Prayer reminds us of that. I wonder if you'd be willing to write this prayer down. God, would you allow me to love people that I'm mad at the same way you love me? God, would you remind me that the same way I've been forgiven is the same way I need to forgive those who have done wrong to me? You see, those are scary prayers to pray. But those are exactly the things that Paul is saying. He says, when I appeal to you, would you step into this gift that we have from God? It says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. See, what we're doing is we're entering into the experiences of our brothers and sisters. You know, it's really, really easy to just let people live their own life. But how beautiful is it when we get to mourn with each other? You know, we, I was talking to somebody yesterday who's losing their mom in a fight for cancer. And, and this person said, I have to jump on a plane this week and I have no idea what to tell her. I have no idea what to say to her. And my encouragement to him was, you know what, man? You can rack your brain all day for the right words, but showing up and just sitting and crying with her is going to speak more than any verse you would give her. Any encouragement, just entering into her brokenness so that she knows she's not alone is one of the best things that you can do for her. I don't know about you, but in the hardest and loneliest places of my life, the hardest part about all of it is sometimes I was alone in that hard part. But would you get people around you? Would you allow yourself to experience the love that comes from your brother and sister entering into your brokenness with you? You know what's even harder sometimes is rejoicing with those who rejoice even when your life isn't where you want it to be. Sometimes it's a little bit harder if we're honest, right? It's a little bit harder to see God blessing somebody when you have this thing that you've been trying to get through and work through and God is working on your heart and it just isn't happening. <clears throat> I want to encourage you, get people in your life that rejoice with you when good things happen to you. Again, that transformational love, God did not intend for us to love each other without each other. His intention was for us to be in community and to love him alongside one another. The Bible also says in this verse 16, live in harmony with one another. So what that means is that we're supposed to be on the same page with each other. That if we both and we all call ourselves followers of Jesus, we need to be reading the same sheet music and playing the same song. We would all point it out really quickly if they came up here and each band member was playing their own song. It would sound horrible. But because every one of them has the same song, the same goal in mind, what they can do is they can read the words. They can be in harmony with each other as they stay in melody. The melody is the baseline, is where you're supposed to be, right? It's where the song is going. The harmony brings strength to the melody. Jesus, in our life, if we're going to be obedient to him, we have to understand he is the melody. He is the song that we are singing. And the harmony that we get to have is with each other, singing the song that he's called us to sing. Get people in your life that are not only celebrating with you when good things happen, but they're going to be on the same page as you. I think this one's really funny. Don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. 
Never be wise in your own sight. Basically what he's saying is don't be conceited. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes that. It's not about you. In prepping for this, one commentary said, don't be surprised when you realize that you are not the center of the world. (laughs) But if we're honest, don't we need that reminder sometime? That there are other things happening outside of who you are. There are other factors at play. There are other things going on. And God is writing a story with many different characters, with one goal in mind. And would we be okay? My sons say this all the time when they're arguing with each other. They say, you think you're the main character. You're not the main character. Right? And like you ever, you ever get asked, uh, I don't even know what you would call it, but like questions that you know you're not hip to, but they're just testing to see how cool you are. I don't have the answer. And uh, we're driving in the car and my son Chris goes, dad, are you the main character? And I'm like, I don't know, big boy was like, I wanted to have confidence in who God was in me, but I didn't want to be conceited. And he's like, you're not the main character. You don't even know. And so (laughs) I love this scripture is that we have to be reminded that the Bible talks about every tribe, every tongue, every nation. It talks more about coming together with our differences rather than being separated because of our differences. Paul doesn't say, oh, we're going to separate the Jews and the Gentiles, but his whole Uh, heart in the book of Romans is bringing everybody together, no Jew or Gentile, no slave or free. And he's developing this theme that in Christ, we are all different because our differences allow us to know that we need each other. The thing that makes us different allows us to see the need that we have for different people. In James, it talks about not picking one and holding one more important than the other. I'll go ahead and read it. James 2 verses 1 through 4. It says, my brother, show no partiality as you hold in, uh, the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if, man, if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, uh, you have not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts. See, when Paul says, don't be conceited, what he's saying is, remind yourself that you are no better than anybody else. That if one sin is in your life, you've failed the test of perfection that Jesus came to answer and to die for. And so therefore, you are in need just as any other man. You are no better. And that's all arguments are, right? Is thinking that because you are better, somebody's wronged you and they need to be punished for it. You guys ever looked up karma videos on YouTube? Right? Someone's getting in an accident and they're not looking and they step off the curb and fall into the pool, right? Like, you're like, yeah, get them. You see, that's not what God's asking us to do. He's saying with this unforgiveness, with this lack of reconciliation, the difference that you are experiencing in expectations, would you allow that to be a place where my love is put on display for you? Desmond Tutu says this. He's a theologian. He says, differences are not intended to separate, to alienate. We are different precisely in order to realize our need for one another. So God's love produces empathy in us. To remind you of the bottom line, the Spirit's primary work is to transform who we are and what we do because of who Christ is and how he loves us. Second part is this, is that love teaches us to be and to have restraint. You ever... uh, I used to think about love all the time as doing all the right things, right? On Valentine's Day, you get the flowers, you do all that stuff, right? Sometimes love is not doing the evil thing. Sometimes love is not doing the wrong thing, right? The Bible says here, it begins to give us commands on what not to do anymore. Do not curse. And again, this command goes against everything that is within us. But the hard part about not being obedient to these commands is that when we know we're disobedient when people aren't watching, Right? It's easy to throw on obedience and forgiveness for a little bit, but unless it's genuine, like the Bible talks about and Paul says here, unless it's genuine, what begins to happen is we begin this, to build this false character that breeds um, a lack of confidence in who we are and what God is doing in some way. Like, I don't remember about you, but when I first gave my life to faith, I was really good at faking how to be a good Christian. But my life, it's like I was living on two different continents, and my heart was pulling me one way, but my flesh was pulling me another, and I didn't know where to stand, and it created within me this lack of confidence. 
I gave a, a message to st- students one time, and um, the message was called uh, Being on the Fence. And what I did was I, I, I had somebody in our church who owned a fence company, and they gave me one kind of like section of a fence. And, uh, you know, I'm a big guy, so I climbed on the fence, and I sat on the top of the fence, and I gave the message while I thought the whole thing was going to fall the whole time. And what I wanted to display to the students was the lack of confidence I had because I wasn't able to be um, rooted in a place that allowed me to find confidence in who God was asking me to be. That when I'm not ready to be obedient, when I'm not ready to give in to the restraint that he's asking me to have, that I'm not going to find confidence in what he's asking me to do. So today, I wonder if there is a place in your life where we need to take off the fake Christianity for a little bit and to deal with the things that are really, really hurting us on the inside. I wonder if you would not just let four weeks of talking about forgiveness and reconciliation be something that that washes over you, but would you jump into it and say, God, is there a place where you are asking me to have more restraint in this area? Are you asking me to no longer to to start to shut my mouth when I want to say something? Will you ask me and will you give me the power? Again, it's not within our own doing, but it's with prayer and asking God to step in. Would you allow me to not be so hateful when I talk? Would you allow me not to, to assume where people are at? You know, sometimes as Christians, we use this Bible as a weapon against our brother and sister to show our superiority. Can I tell you that does not bring God glory? It does not bring God glory to condemn your brother and sister with God's word because last time I checked, God gave us his word so that we would find freedom, that we would find reconciliation, where we would find forgiveness and love. And so if God's word is doing something outside of that, now can I tell you, evil is real, right? There are things that we will need to be corrected to, but don't get ourselves in a position to where we are using God's word in order to break our brother and sister down. I think for those of us who grew up in the church, we've got enough of that. And so this morning, I got a funny video for you. I don't know if you've seen this today, but these are Bible scriptures that this man is using in order to biblically condemn a brother or a sister. You ready? Jazz, are we ready to read it? To see it? Okay. She's going to bring it up right now. Hey, chicken nuggets. These are some Bible verses that you can use if someone hurts their feelings or if you just don't like them. If only you would shut up. And let that be your wisdom. If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. You should mind your own business. (laughs) You can leave, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. Depart from me, you who are cursed. Yes, I know. Be quiet. (laughs) That's super funny. There's a couple I had to cut out just because if you want to see the whole thing, go check it out. (laughs) But I wonder if we would allow the love of God to transform us from the inside out. I wonder if we would allow the vengeance to be God's and not ours. I wonder if we would come to a place where We can look the person that's wronged us in the eye and tell them it's okay. Listen to that statement. God's love is so powerful that he can bring you in front of the person that's hurt you the most. And he can bring you the transformation of your heart and the healing of your heart and the healing of your situation. He will give you the power to look your oppressor in the eye and say, it is okay. Does it make it right? No. Does it mean that it didn't hurt? Not at all. In fact, some of us in this room have endured things from people that would break anybody else. And maybe they've broken you today. What I want to give you hope for is that you do not have to live the rest of your life marked by that brokenness. That forgiveness is a gift that comes from God that you can not only give somebody else, but you give it to yourself. Could you use the gift that God has given you to find freedom in forgiveness and reconciliation. Martin Luther King said this. He says, if we do an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, we will be a blind and toothless nation. (laughs) You see, someone has to break the cycle. 
Someone has to choose to be offended and to be wronged. Even when getting even is probably right in the sight of the world. When everybody in your situation says, you know what, you should get even. You should take revenge. But listen to 12, 19. It says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge and I will repay. You see, when I first read this and I became a Christian, I used to think, yeah, God's going to get him for me in the end. Right? I'd be like, oh, yeah, you wronged me? Watch. God's going to get you. Right? Like we haven't heard God sent his son so that we would all be forgiven by him, right? Like it doesn't make sense. But sometimes when wrong happens to us and when things happen to us, we feel like God is just ready to, to cast condemnation on those who oppose us. When we were once called enemies of God. You see, when he says wrath is mine, that vengeance is mine, what he's not saying is, oh, I'm going to get him in the end. What he's saying is, hey, let me make that call. You know why? Because I know what you don't know about that person. I know what that person's going through and you don't. I know where that person's coming from and you have no idea. I know what their childhood was like. I know what their dad did to them. I know what that family member did to them. I know what triggers them and you don't. I understand their brokenness and their hurt, and you haven't even taken an opportunity to see if it's even there. You see, if God casted his judgment when we asked him to and when we wanted him to, we would be a very, very bad judge. We would be unfair. We wouldn't be just. But he says, vengeance is mine because I am just. I know that they're in need of forgiveness. And don't get me wrong, he's going to take care of sin once and for all like he did on the cross and he's going to come back and we're going to live in a place where these things no longer have an impact on our life. But until then, he's asking, will you help me bring heaven to earth by forgiving those who have wronged you? You see, it's hard, church. Trusting that God will take revenge breaks that cycle of you and I being the ones to get revenge on each other. Verse 21, he says this, he says, don't overcome evil by evil. This is another restraint. Or do not be uh, overcome by evil. This is another restraint that he's asking us to have. He says, would you renew your mind? Would you not listen to the crowd saying, get even, get even, pay him back, right? In high school, what did we do when someone said something crazy? We go, oh, right? (laughs) Hoping that this fight would break out and then they would settle it. But that's not what God's asking us to do. Lacking forgiveness means that we've judged ourselves to be morally superior to the one that we are holding uh, forgiveness for. You and I are not better than anybody else sitting next to us. We're still sinners that fall fallen short. You see, there's no fruit. This is what I was able to encourage a young lady with this morning. There's no fruit in holding on to that burden. There's no fruit in standing in the unforgiveness that you have for somebody. What does it get you? It doesn't get you anything but hurt. It doesn't get you anything but brokenness. But forgiveness will bring healing, wholeness, health, joy, hope. I wonder if today you would be willing to examine the places of your heart where you are holding some unforgiveness. And again, it brings confidence to your walk and your faith in God, right? Knowing that you are doing the things that God is asking you to do, not being perfect, but at least trying. And here's what I hope you hear today is that he's not asking you to be perfect today. He's saying that this is a progress that will take your lifetime in order to achieve. But what I want you to do is I want you to begin to find confidence in the progress that I'm making in you, that there is hope that I'm bringing to you. I got a funny story about how the outside doesn't always match the inside of what's going on. You see, I went through a, I guess I'll call it a style crisis a couple years ago. And, um, and, uh, I got this most, the most fashionable guy I knew, right? I'm like, okay, I'm going to let him test my boundaries. And I, you know, how us Christians always say we got to get out of our comfort zones. I was getting out of my comfort zone with style and I hated everything he picked out for me. And, uh, some shirts I'm like, there's absolutely no way. Um, but it was my trying to get into skinny jeans phase. <laughs> okay. And, uh, it was good. It looked good. Uh, 
I, I look like a bird, right? Big belly, small little legs walking around. Um, don't laugh too hard. But, um, <laughs> And, and so, you know, I'm, I knew that the jeans were skinny, and so when our church used to set up and tear down, and uh, I'd go set up in sweats and a t-shirt, and then right before church was going to happen, I'd go get into my cool clothes, right? And um, I had grabbed the pants from home, and I had them in my bag, and so I'm getting ready in the bathroom, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm taking this a little far. You know what I mean? Like, I almost needed help to get into these things. Um, and, and so I go out there feeling stylish and, you know, brand new, and cool, cool pastor, all that stuff. And, uh, I walk in front of Roxy and she goes, come here. I'm like what? Wait till after babe. There's people watching, you know? And, uh, she goes, she grabs the back of my pants. She checks the tag and she goes, you're wearing my jeans. <laughs> Can I tell you, I didn't have much confidence giving God's word in my wife's pants that morning. <laughs> It was almost like, yeah, he tried, and he tried way too hard, and now we all know it, right? You see, when we begin to be obedient for the life that God is calling us to live, it builds a confidence that only we know about ourselves and he sees and rejoices in. To know that we are shaping ourselves the way that he's called us to, and that by the gift of God and the grace of God, he allows us to fix the things that don't make us like him, but he changes us into somebody who begins to look more and more like him as we get to know him and love him. You see, there's a confidence that comes with that because what happens is when you allow God to change you from the inside out, somebody else will come along the way who used to deal with the same exact thing that you used to deal with. He used to sit in the same brokenness that you sat in, the same brokenness that he's healed you from, and now you have this confidence to say, hey, I know it hurts, but there's hope in Jesus, and let me tell you my story. You see, if we choose not to give in to this obedience that God, this restraint that God is asking us to have, then we will not have the confidence to know that he can change us. But that's what he wants to do. And again, I want to remind you, it's not all within our power. It's a gift from God that says, hey, because of my son and his love for you, these things can happen for your life. Romans 5, 1 through 5 says this. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in, ho in the hope of glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God gives you the power to restrain from doing evil. I also want to say this. There's a beautiful example in the Bible where retaliation and vengeance was probably necessary. It was probably the most evident that it's ever been in any moment that has ever happened on this earth. You see, we are followers of Jesus. There's this beautiful moment in the Bible where curses were probably called for, but yet forgiveness was replaced with it. It's when Jesus is hanging on a cross, put there by his creation, by every soldier that had driven a nail into his hand and into his feet, knowing their story, knowing their brokenness, knowing their hearts being hardened towards who he was on a cross. And what does he say? He doesn't say, Father, I can't wait till you get him. He doesn't say, Father, I can't wait until I get even. He says, Father, would you forgive them? because they don't know what they're doing. If we're followers of Jesus, that's the call, church, is to be able to look at those who have wronged us and say, it's okay. I forgive you. I love you. And we get to do that because we don't know what he's doing in them. And as followers of Jesus, we don't, got, we don't want to get in the way of God's work for his people. What does it look like to forgive and to reconcile? Last point is this, is that God's love empowers us. These are the positive things that we get to do. We get to bless those who persecute us. Again, not easy. We don't have to repay anyone evil for evil, but we have to be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Verse 18 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. For all adults in this room, go and handle your business if you need to forgive somebody. 
It's hard. God promises to never leave you nor forsake you. He'll be there every step of the way, but he's calling you to be obedient in this action towards letting love transform your heart. I love that he says, as far as it depends on you, which means it doesn't matter how the person receives it. It doesn't matter whether they agree with it or not. He's asking, will you take the step towards forgiveness and reconciliation to live at peace with everyone? Martin Luther King also said this. He says, Light or darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And he says, in the same way, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And so what are we going to do as followers of Christ who said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. I wonder if for our, even for our brothers and our sisters and those who don't know him, God, would you forgive them? Would you forgive me? You see, we can't drive a relationship with Jesus to where it needs to be. We won't find our purpose and his plan for our lives if we ignore the unforgiveness in our heart. It doesn't work that way. In fact, I would say he loves you too much to let you continue to go on and bring you to the next level of faith that he has for you until you deal with what he's asking you to do today. He loves us too much to let us do that. Again, Paul talks about this all the time. What do we do? How do we, how do we forgive? How do we get reconciled? Paul's theme throughout all of Romans is just do what God did. Forgive. Love. <laughs> Let go of the debt so that we can be more like Jesus. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, 6, he says, while we were still sinners, the Messiah died for us. When we were enemies to God, he died for us. I wrote it down like this. When human evil reached its height, God came and took its full weight upon himself, thereby exhausting it and opening the way for creation, for the creation of a whole new world. See, Jesus gave us a gift to where forgiveness and reconciliation was even possible. As followers of Jesus. You know, can I even address those who maybe aren't following Jesus today? I know being in your shoes at one point that there was this transformation that my heart desperately wanted, but I didn't know how to obtain. I saw people around me who were diving into their faith and who what I felt God was blessing them, and I felt that I was so far removed from even being qualified for something like that that I didn't allow myself to realize that he will give me everything that I need in order to experience his love for me. The ability to forgive yourself and to be reconciled back to God. Last verse, worship team, you guys can come up here. He says this, he says, don't get even. Don't pay evil for evil. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And again, when I first read that, I was like, yeah, we're gonna get him. Scholars are a little separated on this. There's two thoughts here, all right? You will heap burning coals on his head. Well, and there was an ancient Egyptian tradition where they would, if they were in a state of mourning or regret, that they would carry in a basket burning coals on their head and to let their community know that they were punishing themselves in order uh, to be forgiven by those who they had wronged. And I don't know if, if that's what God is saying, but there is this thought. When you heap burning coals on somebody's head, what you're doing is, is you're helping bring comfort to their home. And let me tell you why is in Jesus' time, hot stones were everything to make his house comfortable. It heated your house. It helped you cook. It helped you boil your water. And what you do, what you do with these hot stones is you use them in order to make the most intimate places of your lives comfortable and healing. And so what he's saying is, is if you do this, if you bless your enemy, if you provide for your enemy, maybe you are being the answer to the one thing that has broken this person. Maybe you can be part of the solution of reaching the need that your enemy has, which opposed him to you in the first place. Would you be willing to pour out grace and mercy and forgiveness on your enemy so that you can turn an enemy into a friend? Because that's exactly what Jesus did for you and me. We were enemies of God. Apart from him. No way back. And he did what was necessary for the guilty to be forgiven. He stood in our rightful place. 
took on the punishment that you and I deserved. And he says, forgive them. He gave his life so that you and I can be reconciled back to God for eternity. As followers of Jesus, we have an amazing opportunity to reconcile our enemies back to God. To be the vessels of forgiveness and grace and mercy and love. So church, this morning I ask you, are you willing to search your heart? Are you willing to open up your heart to a God that wants to transform your life through the power of his love for you? Through the power of his love for the people around you? That's Jesus' call this morning. Is that would you put unforgiveness to the side? It's hard. But when we do hard things for Jesus, it shows him that we trust him. It shows him that we're obedient to his call. And it shows him that we have faith in the love that he has for us. We uh, take communion here every week. Um, and so that should be a good sign for me to grab a communion cup every week, but I didn't. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, this is something that we do all the time. If you are still trying to figure out your relationship with Jesus and whether you've uh, are going to place your faith in him, can we tell you that, that we believe that's the most important decision that you can make is to give your life to the one who gives you the gift of mercy and forgiveness, who gave his life for you. And so if that's you today, in just a little bit, we're gonna have elders in our prayer team up here and it is a perfect opportunity to talk about the grace and mercy that we find in Jesus. If you are a believer here today, this is an opportunity for us to be reminded of what Jesus did for us. One night before he went to the cross, he had a meal with his friends and he said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Would you eat this in remembering me? The same way he took the cup and he said, this represents the blood that I poured out for you. Would you drink this in remembering my love for you and my sacrifice for you? Church, this morning, I, I pray that you would give the transforming love of Christ an opportunity to change your heart, to make you more like him, to bring to you the gift that he desperately wants to give you. Would you lay down the right to be right today? Would you lay down the right to take vengeance and to get even and would you find not only forgiveness for yourself, but forgiveness for those who've wronged you in the transforming love of Jesus? Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for what you've done for us, God, that, that these aren't just suggestions for us, God, but like Paul says, that he appeals to us that we would take these things to heart and to do something about them. That we realize we can't do it within our own power, but by the grace, mercy, and love that you've poured over our lives we can have the courage and the strength to forgive those who have hurt us, God. God, I pray that this series of forgiveness and reconciliation will be one where we are constantly looking at our hearts to see where you may be calling us, God. Dealing with the next piece of unforgiveness, experiencing hope, joy, and love through your reconciliation, God. We are so thankful that it doesn't depend on what we do, but what you've done for us. God, we love you and we trust you and we pray that you would continue to make us more like you, that you would continue to make us more like the person that you intended us to be. Thank you for your patience and your grace. For all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, let's respond in a surrendered heart of worship to your heart.
Thank you, worship team. God bless you all for being with us today to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. We praise God for each and every one of you. We praise God for the contributions, for the tithes, the offerings that support this ministry. May the Lord richly bless you. And uh, we're going to be up here to pray for you, as Pastor Joe mentioned. And I just love that he talked about this transformational love. I have a verse in 1 Peter chapter 1. It says, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, that first part is talking about, of course, our salvation, our transformation from the old to the new. And it says, so that you have sincere love for each other, that you love one another deeply from the heart. So don't forget, we've been transformed. We still have the so that. God is wanting us 
not just to get that key to heaven, but he wants us also to do the so that, which is have that sincere love. Not just a, a love that says, hey, I love you, brother. Hug and don't see him. But one that's sincere, one that's deep, and one that's from the heart. Amen. It could be inconvenient, but God knows. Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be your children, your disciples. And I pray for each and every one of us, Lord, especially myself, Almighty God, that you, you have changed us. And now, Lord, you want us. You want us to love one another with sincere hearts. Lord, just like it says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, to value others above ourselves. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your word. And I pray, Lord, that as we go, as we go our separate ways, Lord, I pray for each and every one of us that our lights would shine, that people would know, people would see, Father, that you are the almighty God. You are the one who saves. You are the light of the world. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.